I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis this morning, Genesis, the 25th chapter. While you're turning there, I won't say a word bad about Brother Crichton. Simply want to say he has my, my undying respect, any man his age that can get his leg that high above his head in a public gathering, not knowing if he'll ever get it back down again, has my undying respect. So that being said, come tonight to hear the Lord's word and see if Brother Crichton injures himself, all right? Genesis chapter 25, if you'll go with me to, to verse 20. Now the Bible says, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment and called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out and his hand took hold on Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. And the boys grew. I have that phrase underlined in my Bible. What wonderful memories just a few simple words can bring to your mind. And the boys grew. And they do grow, and before you know, they're grown. And the Bible says, And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I'm faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. As we get, begin to read in this chapter, verse 20, and we see that Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, married 20 years, 20 years of barrenness, infertility, 20 years of prayer, and God blesses their home with these two little boys. And the Bible says of them in verse 24, there were twins in her womb. Twins, yes, but no two brothers uh, could have differed more. Before their birth, God told them that they would be different. At their birth, it was evident how different they were. And from then on, the difference between them only increased. They differed in appearance. It was obvious. Esau was rough. He was ruddy. He was a, a hairy individual. He had great physical strength. And he had one of those personalities that pushed him to, to hazardous and exciting pursuits. Jacob, on the other hand, was smooth-skinned and dark-complected, slightly built. He was no physical match for his brother in any way, shape, or form, but he was more than his match in cleverness and guile. And not only that, but they differed in pursuits and interest. Esau was a, a cunning hunter. He was a man of the field. I think you would have said that he was an A-type personality. If he lived today, he would have been involved in every manly, daring, extreme outdoor sport that you could mention. He was probably extremely popular. I think he was handsome. He was outgoing. He, he was the type of individual, if he walked into a room, he would gather people's attention. Uh, no doubt, when the occasion arose, he was dressed well. I think he had polished manners, and, and I would describe him as being aggressively successful. Everything that he attempted, he went full out in it. Jacob, on the other hand, loved the simple home life. And the adventures of Esau didn't hold any attraction for him. Uh, he was content, the Bible tells us, among the flocks and the herds. And 
to live the life of a simple gentleman shepherd, a gentleman farmer. But where these two boys differed the most was in their character. And when you look at Esau, what's not to like about him? I think if we didn't know the end of the story, we would have been much more naturally attracted to Esau than to Jacob. Yes, he was impulsive, but he was a generous man. He was rash, but he was direct. He was of little spiritual interest, but he was a good son, the Bible tells us. He was consumed by his desires, consumed by the hunt, but I'd say that on the hunt he was great company and there was no doubt he was a man's man. However, Esau was undeniably sensual. The Bible describes him in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16, and we'll turn there in a few moments, as a profane person. That simply means that he was a slave to his senses. He was up to every adventure, to every thrill. He was willing to pay for excitement no matter how much it cost him. He was so enamored with today that he was unwilling to see, let alone care, for the unseen realities of eternity. And sad to say, even in our day, and sadder still, among God's own people, he has a host of imitators. Jacob, on the other hand, was, the Bible tells us, a plain man. That means he was a quiet individual. But hidden under what we might look at and judge to be a boring exterior, there were great depths. By nature, he was a supplanter. He was named that from the womb. Uh, he was the kind of individual who nipped at your heels and he would cut corners and he would trip you up and take every advantage. But still, he was capable of great spiritual understanding and great faith in God as we see in the years to come. He understood the value of something called the birthright. He was able to dream of a ladder that reached to heaven and connected him with God. And he wrestled all night long with his God. Yeah, Esau would chase the pleasure of the hour. But Jacob, he would yearn for the spiritual heritage that was summed up in the simple word, the birthright. I want you to consider with me this morning the birthright, the bargain, and a bitter cry. And I want you to notice, first of all, the birthright. The birthright that he despised. What was it? Well, for one thing, it was not worldly prosperity. Esau lost the birthright, but he had a personal fortune that he had amassed. 400 armed men at his beck and call. He lived in unbroken prosperity. He died a peaceful death, gathered to his people at a, a good old age. There was nothing to tell us that he lived any kind of life that would have been a disappointment. All the world was his. And the momentary disappointment that he felt at losing the birthright and the blessing of his father, Isaac, soon faded because he had lost nothing that he really cared about and everything that he loved was still his. So no, the birthright was not prosperity. Esau, who lost the birthright, had infinitely more of it than Jacob, who had won the birthright. But neither was it immunity from sorrow. Jacob got the birthright, and it seemed as soon as he was able to secure it, every conceivable ill known to man marched to the door of his life. Immediately, he has to flee for his life and spends the next 20-some-odd years away from his family. His mother dies. He never sees her again. The prime years of his manhood he spends as a lowly hireling in the house of a relative. He's crippled for life. And on the way back home, he buries his beloved wife, Rachel. He grieves over his bitterly divided children. He's bereaved of three of his sons at various times in his life. I ask you, who has walked a more rugged and weary path than Jacob? No, the birthright was not freedom from pain and grief because Jacob, who won the birthright, had infinitely more of it than Esau, who had lost the birthright. What the birthright was, was a spiritual heritage. It was a gift that could be opened by faith alone. It was an amazing collection of privileges that Jacob valued and Esau despised. It was the right to be the priest of the family, to be the communicator and depository of the communication of God Almighty. It was an opportunity to be a link in the descent of the Messiah. It was the right to claim the promises made to his grandfather Abraham. It was the right of being a pilgrim 
owning not one square inch of earth on this planet, but knowing that all of heaven was his. All of this and more was summed up in the word birthright. It was a wonderful heritage, but I tell you this, an infinitely better one belongs to the lowliest child of God sitting in this room this morning. Because you are born into a family redeemed at exceeding price of his precious blood. You have the right of being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. To be forgiven and saved from sin and the wrath to come. To become the sons and daughters of almighty God and to stand side by side with Jesus Christ as joint heirs of all that is his. This is the glorious birthright of every child of God. And by the way, we get to stand before the throne of God with the congregation of saints and sing the inexhaustible praises of our God for all eternity. But you know, the marvel of all eternity is that such a destiny was placed within the reach of you and me. That's the birthright. And by the way, that's what Esau despised. I want you to see, secondly, the bargain that he made. In this bargain, Esau comes in from a long day of hunting. Jacob is in the kitchen. I've never been much around the kitchen, don't ever intend to get experienced in the kitchen. But Jacob was in the kitchen and he was cooking some sort of a stew. I wouldn't be interested in it because it was all vegetables. There wasn't any meat in it at all. But Esau was famished and he came in. And uh, as most of us do when we're in some kind of physical despair, we always overestimate our distress. And he says to his brother, give me, I'm about ready to die, give me of that pottage that you're cooking. And Jacob, not being an entirely selfish individual, but he saw an opportunity to get what he valued and he knew meant very little to his brother. And so he says to Esau, I'll do it on one condition that you sell me your birthright. And I don't think that Esau immediately made the bargain. I, I think he thought about it. I think there were some pangs of conscience because I, I think he knew the disappointment, the utter disappointment that would be his parcel from his father when his father realized what he had done. But he said to his brother, I'm at the point to die. And what shall this birthright do for me in this situation? Jacob said, swear to me, he swore. And the Bible says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Jacob was not without fault here. He was a traitor to his brother, but even more so, he was a traitor towards his God. You see, it had been whispered to his mother that the older would serve the younger. He knew that. His mother told him that time and time again. But not only that, something we don't consider very often, his grandfather Abraham lived the first 18 years of his life. And what do you think it would have been to sit at the feet of Abraham and hear Abraham tell about that night in the Ur of the Chaldees when God appeared to him and said, leave it all behind and, and I'll show you the land that you'll go to and how God delivered him from every situation he ever gotten into and as he rehearsed to Jacob the promises and Jacob put that with what his mother had been told and he realized those things apply to me those promises are mine what he didn't stop to realize was that the God of his grandfather Abraham was well able to give him the promises he didn't need his miserable schemes and by the way God doesn't need our miserable schemes but Esau I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 12, if you would, and go to verse 16. Esau, for everything that we think of him, for everything that we judge him to be by first impression, is not that at all to God. And we must be careful that we judge neither ourselves nor others by our own prerequisites, but that we see what God thinks of an individual and what God thinks of their character. And in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse, verse uh, 16, rather, God gives us his take on Esau. He says in verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And that's what we hear God saying about Esau. What does God say about you? What does God say about the things that you despise, that he values, that you should value? 
If we were there this, that, this morning with Esau and Jacob, no doubt we would have come up to Jacob and put our hand, or Esau rather, and put our hand on his shoulder and said, Esau, think for a moment before you make this bargain, before you barter away the birthright. You're giving away the spiritual for the physical. You're giving away the eternal for the temporal. You're giving away the unseen for the seen. Esau, will it pay? Esau, is it wise? Esau, will you ever get back what you're giving away now forever? And we're good at asking these questions of people that have been dead for 3,000 years. But what about ourselves? You see, more of us than want to admit it this morning are Esau's. We've despised our birthright. We've despised the opportunities God has given us, the privileges, the status that God has given us. We bargained those things away. We bartered those things away for an hour's excitement, an hour's enjoyment. Yes, it smells savory. Yes, it promises to do you more good in this moment than all the Bible put together. And the tempter whispers to you, thou shalt not surely die. And then he whispers, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. And in that moment, a still small voice, like the voice of our Savior in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36 says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? This is the bargain. And this is the bargain that Esau made. And then I want you to see the bitter cry that he could not reverse. The bitter cry that he could not reverse. I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 27. And when you get there, go with me to verse 34. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 34, to give you the background as you're turning, time has gone by now, not a long time, maybe a few years. Isaac believes that his time to die has come. He's about to give the blessing. Jacob, always the supplanter, always the deceiver, uh, alters not just his appearance, but the feel of his body, the scent of his body, so as to deceive his father. He goes in smelling like Esau and feeling like Esau to his father's diminished senses. And he steals away the blessing. And by the way, Isaac knew the prophecies as well, but Isaac was intent on circumventing the will of God and giving that blessing to Esau, his son. Jacob goes in, circumvents Isaac's will, steals the blessing. Just a few moments later, Esau comes in from the hunt, prepares the venison, brings it on a plate into his father's tent. His father says, who are you? He says, I'm Esau, your son. He says, come close where I can feel you. He said, it's you. He says, your younger brother's come. He's stolen away, stolen away your birthright. And Esau says, bless me as well, father. Look in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 34. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. And I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17 as we look at this bitter cry that he could not reverse. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16, we, we get God's take on Esau's character that he is a profane individual who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. We follow up in verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 12 with the words, For you know how that afterward... You ought to underline that phrase. For you know how that afterward... The problem is that we don't make a habit of living in the afterward. We live in the now. We live at Esau time. We take advantage of everything the world has to give us right now, even as believers. But afterward is coming. It says, for you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing. In other words, he began to value it. He was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now we need to be careful here. Because honestly, it is not possible for an individual to desire to repent and find forgiveness and not find the ready help of the Holy Spirit of God. It is possible to become so hardened as to not desire salvation. The repentance that's being spoken of here in this 17th verse of Hebrews chapter 12 is not repentance to salvation, 
but it is the power of reversing the past. You see, Esau had come to a time in his life where now he had some understanding of the birthright. He desired the birthright, but the Bible tells us that he was rejected. And by the way, Esau had long despised his birthright. What we read in verses 33 and 34 of Genesis chapter 26 is not a decision that was arrived at in a moment. His low regard for spiritual things, his utter ignorance of the will and purpose of God for his life, his disdain for all things godly, his desire to live for the excitement of the moment had been something that had generated and germinated in his heart for many years. But when it crystallized itself into an act, into words, then God took him at his word, and he could no longer reverse it. The fact is, folks, that the past is irrevocable. It is irreversible. It's a sad thing. We would give the world, if we could, all of us have something in our lives, and maybe we're the only ones that know of it, and to someone else it may not be all that impactful, but to us we would give all that we had if we could roll the clock back and erase the blot on the past and make it as if it had never happened. But the fact is that God himself cannot undo the past. He has put himself in that position. We cannot bring back the shadow of our life's clock one degree on the dial. But I have news for you. Even though the past is irrevocable, it is not irreparable. I want you to look with me in John chapter 21. This is one of the sweetest to me chapters in all of Scripture. In John chapter 18, Peter denies the Lord. And the Bible says, immediately the cock crew. The afterward came, didn't it? You see, in earlier chapters of that gospel and almost every other gospel record, our Lord had told Peter that this was to come. And Peter said, no, no, no. I will go with thee to death. I will not deny thee. And our Lord said, you'll not only deny me, but you'll deny me three times. And the Bible simply says, in chapter 18 of the book of John, immediately the cock crew. And what happened? The Bible tells us in the book of Luke that Peter goes out and he weeps bitterly. But you know, the tears could not erase his words. They could not erase his denial. And they certainly couldn't blot from his memory the look of the Savior in that hour. I tell you again, God himself cannot undo the past, but he can and will and he longs to forgive. In John chapter 21, we have one of the post-resurrection experiences of our Lord with his disciples. It's one of the most amazing things. He, he shows himself to the disciples. And if you look with me in uh, verse 15, the Bible says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth, lovest me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. 
You know, the fact is that our Lord can and will and longs to forgive us. He will not mention the past. Did you notice that in this passage of Scripture? No mention of Peter's abject failure. He will give us new opportunities to tell us how much, tell him how much that we love him and how much we desire to serve him in the desires of the future. He will not even mention our three denials, but he will give us at least three opportunities to serve him and to love him. You see, in John chapter 18, we have the words, immediately the cock crew. That is a statement of the irrevocable past that can never be undone. But here in John chapter 21, we have the words, follow thou me. And that is our bright future. The future, irreversible, but not irreparable. You do not have to face your future as an Esau. 